Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me again today. One of these days, I'm going to buy uh, one of those clappers. And it's going to say Daily Art Adventure number 497. But I don't have one yet, so we're all waiting. <laughs> that will become part of my shtick. <laughs> good word, that shtick, don't you think? That's a good word. It sounds German. I certainly suspect it came from Germany. Anyway, that's what the, for those, for you newcomers, that's what the, the DAA at the end of the title there, that's what that means, Daily Art Adventure, number 497. And many of those are made up of three, four, five different episodes. So uh, I'm, I don't know, 1,500 videos on YouTube or something like that. Anyway, this is, I started this yesterday. Let me try to adjust this so you can see a little bit more of the, there we go. I called it painting traffic. And uh, I'm enjoying it just as much as I, I thought I would. And I've almost finished here um, drawing with pencils. This is one of the tricks, by the way, when, if you're drawing two parallel lines, you, uh, I, you literally can draw or paint twice as fast sometimes with two pencils as you, as you can with one. Not all the time, but sometimes. Okay, I'm really done all the pencil. I want to, for a moment, I want to zero in on one very particular part of this uh, painting so that you can see really clearly a principle. Okay, is that going to stay in focus? I hope so going to stay in focus? Yeah? Okay. A principle that I talk about quite often. The front of this car. Yeah. Here's, here's the photograph. All right? And here's the front of the car. Now, I have drawn it three different times. Let me put up three fingers. <laughs> I've drawn this car three different times in three different places. The first time I drew it, so to speak, was in blue. Do you see this blue line right here? That's where I thought the, the windshield of this car was. Then I came in sometime later and drew it with white. Do you see this white mark? So I moved it about three-eighths of an inch to the right. So that's mark number two. And then when I was drawing with pencils, I, again, looking at my photograph each time, I said, doggone, that's not right. The angle's wrong and the position's wrong. So now you can see I've actually drew it with pencils right there. So I've, I've positioned that three times. The reason I point, is to point that out is twofold. Number one, always be ready, 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 ready. Did I say that enough times? Always be ready to change your mind. Don't get locked in just because you put something down one time. Don't die on that hill. Be willing to move. With every time you render, every time I draw this, I, I'm going to move. So that flexible mindset is really important. And uh, if nobody's ever told you that before, file it away now. The other thing I want to say about this, I call it iterative, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, this, this stutter uh, stepping line, is that I usually say do not erase or don't try to cover up out of embarrassment or anything else. Don't usually don't try to cover up the mistakes because it turns out that all these quote unquote mistakes will actually serve me quite well in the later, later stages of this painting because it'll create energy. Yeah, just the best word for it. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, the, the mistakes are better than if I got it right every time. These, these iterative stop-start accidental wrong marks will make this little bit of the painting actually better than if I got it right every time. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to do another white layer right now, but I do want to show you, since I'm zeroed in on that spot right there, I, I do want to show you... Um, that I am going to, again, make corrections. So the last thing I did was pencil. The next thing I'm, and it's a light colored line. So the next thing I'm going to do is paint it in white. Okay. So this time, for the first time on this, this bit of the painting, I'm actually reinforcing what's there. But I'm not going to go to white right now. So let me clean up that brush. The next thing in line, I feel like for me on this painting is actually um, dark 
some dark details. Now, let me, before I start painting, I do want to back up, so to speak. There, can you see? Oh, no, you can't see that so well. Let me try to fix it. I do want to back up and just, just talk about the painting in general. It's a mess, isn't it? But I like it a lot. I'm already at a point with this painting where this painting is mine to screw up. <laughs> in other words, I'm, it's hard to, hard to describe why. Um, yeah, I'm, saying, I'm telling you this partly to help me. The greatest danger I face with this painting, the way it is right now, is that I'm going to cover up too much of this mess. So I'm going to, I'm pulling back on the rain saying, whoa, Nelly, whoa, 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 whoa. Do not paint too much. Whoa, Nelly, I guess that's short for Nelson in this case. Do not paint too much. So you guys are there to help me not paint too much. <laughs> Suddenly, this is your problem. <laughs> And there, we still on screen? Yeah, we are. I'm going to sit down for just a few minutes, grabbing some uh, phthalo blue. Um, again, for those of you who might be new, I'm in acrylics still, and these are my eight pre-mixed acrylics. I haven't even opened the brown one. That's by, by far the least used color is brown uh, because it's a color killer. And you, Normally, you're not wanting to color, kill color when you're painting at colored oil painting. Um, but uh, there's some phthalo and purple. Oh, <laughs> and guess what? A little brown. I want to, <laughs> no sooner do I say that. I, wanna, I do want to kill that color just a little bit because I'm, I'm mi mixing up here just a, a dark tone. I'm going to start all the way down here at the bottom. Looking, again, looking at my reference, looking at my photograph. Not for any, not for any particular, particularly scientific or analytical reason. I just, I want to start with the, uh, this clot. Um, I have, since I painted a lot of small towns, I've come to learn that this, this kind of clock, I don't know who, I don't know what era it comes from. It looks like an early 20th century, but it might be maybe as late as the 30s or 40s, maybe even the 50s, but it looks like a, you know, it's a, it's a time, a classic, old, uh, traditional look. And whatever company made these back 80 or 100 years ago, somebody did a darn good job of selling them because I see this exact clock in small towns all across the country. So they're cute, they're quaint, they add a little bit of, you know, atmosphere. They're usually in, I should say, in cute, quaint, cute, quaint towns. You know, the, uh, I, I, I don't know, well, New York has everything, but, you know, I mean, they tend to be in, uh, I think that's interesting. Okay, so there's, Mostly a purplish, dull purple-ish color. Uh, while I'm doing dark colors, let's do these windows. So I, as you can see, I'm being quite a bit more definitive. I'm uh, coloring in the lines on this painting, really for the first time on this painting. Up until now, it's just been a big mess. But I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to stay neat. This, this is just one, one layer where I feel like I should be a little bit neat. But, 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 I don't want to, like, do you see this orange slash mark that goes right through, right through that window? That's the kind of thing I don't want to lose. Why? Because it's beautiful. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Because it looks cool. I have uh, four grandchildren my wife and I have had four grandchildren living in our home for the last year and a half. We're having a high old time. And their parents. 
and uh, they're looking for a home in the area, which is a sizable challenge. We're great, glad to have them, and I, we're loving. I mean, of course, it interrupts everything, as you can imagine. But um, they ask me, of course, being children, Bigka. They call me Bigka instead of Grandpa. Bigka, why'd you do that? Why? you do that when I do something on the painting? I've discovered because of their typical child, childish inquiry, I've discovered that I have the same answer to every question that they ask. And this is a significant insight. Bika, why'd you do that? The answer is because I think it looks cool. Or more precisely, because, why did you do that? Because I thought it was going to look cool. Because I think it's going to look cool. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why an artist, why an artist makes every mark that he makes. Why'd you do that? Because I thought it was going to look cool. <laughs> Sometimes you change your mind and go, it didn't look as cool as I thought. <laughs> right? <laughs> but you, why do you do things? Of course, I, as a teacher, I try to come up with a little more contentful answer than just that. But frankly, that's, that's the real answer to almost every question. Why'd you do that, Vika? And why do I want that orange to show through? Why do I want, now I want to cover it up? Because I think it'll look cool. That's why, because I think it'll look cool. Now, I mentioned yesterday, let me, for those of you who may have missed it, um, I've been I've been thinking about painting a scene like this. And let me go ahead and get some other photographs to show you. I've been thinking about doing these this kind of painting for quite a long time. I did one three or four years ago. It sold fairly quickly at Nicole's, and I'm calling it painting traffic. Let me show you some of the other. Uh, I edited another one this morning upstairs on my computer and didn't print it off. But here's some of the other samples. Painting traffic. I'm going to try to do it so you can't see all the... So, yeah, yeah. oh, and I've got some noise here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, there's one. There's another one. Oh, but believe me, I answer more than just it looks cool. I give them more content, but I, it always starts out with that. So they have the right idea. Anyway, do you see it? They're all traffic. Sometimes, like this one, the traffic is not moving. It's just a road parked cars. And uh, part of the vision that I have for the, the series of paintings, well, I hope they sell and I hope I make money. <laughs> Um, but besides that, part of the vision is um, that the, the automobiles are painted very accurately, sort of as, as if I were doing a figurative painting, pa a painting with people in it, except in this case, instead of people, it's cars. But I want them, I want them quite, quite accurate. At the same time, I want the paintings very loose. Does that make sense? Loose paintings, accurate renderings. That's, that's what I'm after. And uh, again, I'm, I want to be very careful that I don't cover up too much. Even with what I'm doing right now, I, I want to ask myself bef before every stroke, do I really need to make this mark? Do I need to make this mark? Or am I just painting sort of in autopilot? Ah, that's a good word. I usually call that, that painting in autopilot, which means you decide what you're going to do, then you turn off your brain and you do it. I usually call that painting the barn. Painting the barn. I've used that expression for a dozen years. Here's, here's what that means. You're painting a landscape, has got a barn in it. The barn's red, you got it all outlined, you paint the barn. You, you mix up some red paint and you paint it. In other words, you turn off your brain while you're painting. Or another word for that would be painting in autopilot. And I do not want to find myself, catch myself here, painting in autopilot. Do I need to make this mark? Yeah, I, I think I do. Do I need to make this mark? I, I, I think I do. But if I follow that, if my answer to the, every question is yes, then I'm probably doing too much. So the answer to, cannot be to every question, yeah, I need to make this mark. Same thing for you, whoever you are. Do I need to paint the grill of this truck? Yeah, I think I do. Of course. Do I need to paint this sign? I think. Do I need to paint this person? I 
think so, but not very carefully. Uh, do I need to paint the dark window behind this person? I think I do. Anyway, I, I won't continue with that dialogue, but that's what I'm asking myself. Do I need to color this in dark? I do, but I certainly don't want to cover up all that crazy stuff that's already in there. That red mark and that yellow mark. Why? Because they look cool or because I think it's going to look cool. Um, okay, so a little bit better, a little bit more explanation. I think they're going, it's going to look cool. Why? Well, again, one of my, not helping you much, but a little bit, one of my favorite words when talking about painting is energy. Visual energy. Visual energy. Every mark that you make has a certain level of it. Whoa, why are we out of focus? I don't know. Forgive me. Every mark that we make has a certain degree of energy. And if you make yourself aware of, is this mark or that mark high energy or low energy? And I don't think, you don't even need to tell me. You don't need me to tell you what high energy marks are. Intense color, strong contrast. Hard edges, those are the, the, not necessarily in that order, those are the three. Uh, another way is any mark that's made with a great deal of energy <laughs> will probably read, look like it was created with a high degree of energy. Does that make sense? So um, why do I want, for instance, you, if you watch me start this painting, I, I started by making a big, ab beautiful, abstract painting in about 30 or 40 seconds. It was fast, it was glorious, <laughs> it was fun, it was beautiful. And that's how I start pretty much all my paintings in the last two years or so. I don't even know exactly when I started that, that practice. It's, it's been, I, I think it's been developing over a period of time. Um, so I have all these, this, this red stuff, the, this orange, like I love, frankly, I mean, I love, you can see it well, I love the back of this car. Again, let me show you the photograph just to give you a contrast. Here's the photograph. My painting's going to look more like this than this. Why? Well, because I think it'll look cool. Two, energy. So we're getting, we're getting closer to it. Another word would be interesting to look at. <laughs> Um, um, and now it, it, it should be pretty obvious to anyone that I'm not talking about realism here because, and, and again, let me show you the photograph, painting the back of this car realistically would be really easy. That is not hard. You might say, well, getting the gradation, <laughs> no, that's easy. I take it to do it realistic might take me 10, 20 minutes, but easy. But it'd be boring compared to that. Um, uh, let, me, let me try to come up with some other descriptors. Why do I want energy? Um, part of the answer is because you, say, the viewer, the people who will look, the consumers, if you will, the consumers of my painting, those who look at it when it's finished, they will easily, easily discern that this is a car. In fact, some people will discern it's a Cadillac. Some people will discern this is a Subaru. I don't know if it is a Subaru, whatever it is. People, the, but the, it, even if you don't know what kind of car, people know the car, car, clock, building, windows, van, person, person. That's the easy part. That does not particularly give them a great deal of pleasure, aesthetic pleasure. What does give them particular degree of aesthetic pleasure is if those objects, those objects, car, car, clock, building, people, planter, have things in, around, and through them that don't quite make literal, logical sense, but they look interesting. Does that make sense? Um, they'll, they'll be able to see the car, 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 clock, building, in spite of these abstract marks, in spite of them. 
I see this. Let me, let me continue to ramble a little bit, explain why I like high energy. Um, I paint, if you follow me, you know, I paint quite often uh, in public places on the street because I do a lot of city. Now, I'm in, happily in my own studio today painting in private, but not quite because you're watching me, so <laughs> it's not even in private. I paint better with an audience, by the way. That's part of the reason why I broadcast almost every time I paint because you guys are actually helping me paint better. I don't have enough energy in the room when it's just me all by myself. I struggle to, to come up. And frankly, when you're not watching, I, I typically put on podcasts with talking, teaching, talking, philosophy, history, uh, science, stuff like that. Um, okay, where about, oh, so I'm painting on the street very often. I paint on the street a lot. And uh, I can see people walking, if my canvases, I see people walking toward me on the sidewalk. And some people see me afar off. They notice, oh, look, there's an artist. That's kind of interesting. Most of the time, people think artists are interesting because it's not something you see every day. So some, especially those who are more artist, art lovers, as they walk toward me, I can sort of see their, their anticipation or curiosity mounting as they get closer and closer to me. They, they are curious. They, they wonder what, frankly, what they're going to see when they come around and see the front of my canvas. And if I've done a good job, if I'm like at this stage, at this point in a painting, I, I, it's quite predictable. If I'm doing a good job, as I am doing today, most of the time I'm doing a good job, but not always, not always, but I'm pretty happy with this one, the way it's going. So if I'm doing a good job, as I am today, they come around my canvas, around the corner, and look at my canvas, and their face is truly something, but I can tell they are experiencing a, a surprise of pleasure. Now, here's the key concept. They're experiencing a, a surprising degree of pleasure. They're surprised at the degree. They're surprised at what they look like, at, at they look at. And here is what is creating the pleasure in them is not that there's car, car, clock, and building, for instance, because they, they know what I'm painting. You know, they can tell what I'm looking at. Let's just pretend they can. I'm not going to chase that down. A lot of times they can't tell what I'm painting. But I mean, anyway. What gives them the pleasure is not recognizing car, car, clock, and building. What gives them the pleasure is the fact that their mind does recognize car, car, clock, and building, even though I've messed it all up, so to speak. Even though there's, if it was a realistic painting, they would come around my canvas, they would come around the corner, and they would experience a very different kind of pleasure. Now, it would be a kind of pleasure. Let's not forget, people... Human beings, this is a universal principle, in spite of everything the art professors in the West, all art professors in all universities say, in spite of what they say, human beings do consistently get a kick out of seeing something, anything, accurately rendered by a human being. Okay, so mark that down, remember it. Human beings, people, myself included, Artists, non-artists, everybody, we all, except those grumpy professors, we all get a kick out of seeing something accurately rendered by a human being. We don't get a kick out of, we don't get that same kick out of a photograph of that thing. The photographer, if he or she is good, has to do something extra, sort of like I'm doing something extra. There has to be something extra in the photograph to create that little buzz of aesthetics. But anyway, um, it's not, it's, if they came around and saw a realistic painting, they'd go, wow, sorry about the unfocus. They would say, wow, that is so amazing. You must have been out, how long have you been out here? That is a lot of work. Wow, that takes a lot of time. You are really good. Stuff like that. What they would be amazed at is the, my industry, my, the amount of, maybe my skill, and the amount of time that I spent. But it, they, they wouldn't be surprised. Well, they might be surprised by my skill. Am, am I making sense? But when they come around the corner 
and see something that is not what they expected, which is easily recognized, car, car, clock, and building. I'm using that as an example. That's the part that doesn't surprise them. The part that does is the mess that's on top of, in this case, underneath those, those objects. Whew. Boy, that was a long explanation, wasn't it? Somebody out there needed to hear that. <laughs> uh. So I, uh, all that is to say, uh, among other things, that I want to be very careful that I don't overpaint and lose that the surprising element that I've been talking about. I had an experience about four weeks ago for th I think three days in a row. Whew, it was it was rough. It was grueling. For three or f three days in a row, I spent the hours I've, I've had this in my list of things to do. I've had this list, this uh, item, prepare paintings for Fine Art America. Maybe you know you can order copies of my paintings, prints, at, and some originals, by the way, at Fine Art America. Um, so I spent three days. It takes me roughly 30 minutes per painting. And I uploaded over 100 paintings, so do the math. Um, what was interesting to me is that I don't think I've ever had a more intense uh, retrospective that's the word, that's a technical word. I don't think I've ever had a, such an intense retrospective uh, view of my paintings. I see my old stuff every once in a while, uh, here, you know, online and on my websites and in my attic and so on and so forth, but uh, not a whole bunch of it. Well, during those three days, I saw a whole bunch, some of my paint, I went back and looked at some paintings that were four or five years old. Uh, most of the time, I don't like the stuff that I did five years ago because, thank goodness, I'm better now than I was five years ago. But every once in a while, and, and in this case, I, I, I kept paintings for Fine Art America, only the ones that I really liked. So I, I wasn't going back and looking at everything. I was just look, going back and looking at paintings I did some time ago that were pretty good. So I was happily surprised that there were... There were several paintings from that era that I like. Anyway, the point is, I saw a hundred, two, three, four hundred of my old artwork. Okay, so it was it was a learning experience. It was an aha moment because I discovered more than ever before that across the board. The paintings of mine that I liked best, all in this genre. I'm not talking about my hyper-realistic portraits or the one still life I did last year. I'm not talking about the, where I just take a hard left, hard right and paint realism for fun, which it is fun. No, I'm talking about this in abstract, realistic stuff. Across the board, the paintings from my history that I, that I liked best were... Loose ones. Oh man, that was kind of good news, bad news. It was good news to learn that lesson. It was bad news to see how many paintings I had overdone over the years because I overpainted them. So I'm saying to myself here as I paint today, I've got a good painting in the works and I know I am fully capable of overpainting. <laughs> I know I'm very capable of ruining this nice painting. I hope I haven't done it with this dark layer. As you, you know, if you go back to where I was 20, 30 minutes ago when I started this broadcast and the difference in the, the canvas now versus the way it was 20 minutes ago, it's pretty, pretty strong difference. And I hope I haven't ruined it. I don't think I have. I don't think I have, but I hope I haven't. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there, stop the broadcast. I tell you, I'm gonna tell you where I'm going from here. Uh, I'm going to give myself a break, give you a break, and uh, I'm going to finish this, the dark layer. I'm almost finished, as you can see. Then I'm going to do one more layer of white, 
Come on, focus, focus, focus. There we go. One more layer of white highlights. And I'll probably do that without your company. I'm rethinking that now all of a sudden. Anyway, I, do, I might do a glaze and then white. Yeah, probably. Some glazes, then white, then I switch to oil. I'll bring you back in when I switch to oil. Thank you guys for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, unless I've bored you to tears, in which case just move on and you forget you ever saw me. <laughs> We'll have nice lives separately. But if you like what I just did, please subscribe. And if you have some artist friends, please tell them about me. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I've got some comments here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me take a minute to get these because this is the one good thing. The one good thing about broadcasting straight from my phone is the comments stay here. Mark and reprisal. Yeah. Uh, the gooning. <laughs> yeah, energy. Was that comment about energy? Oh, can I turn the autofocus off? I don't think I can, but I will check it out. Thank you, Gizmo. Um, and then Gizmo Goose says, I like that you use a, use small brushes and leave a drawn-like look and feel. Great line quality. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for watching. I don't think you're a regular, are you? Thanks for hanging in there with me. Thanks. And I'll check on the autofocus thing.